Welcome to Computer and Network Security. Today our topic is on intrusion detection. Okay, so one of the two most publicized threats to security is an intruder, with the other one being something we already talked about, uh, which is uh, viruses. Uh, intruders are often called hackers, um, and there are three different classes of intruders. The first one is a masquerader. An individual who's not authorized to use the computer and then penetrates a system's access controls to exploit a legitimate user's account. Uh, a misfeasor, a legitimate user who accesses data programs or resources for which access is not authorized or who is authorized for such access but misuses his or her privileges. And then uh, the clandestine user, uh, an individual who seizes supervisory control of the system and uses this control to evade uh, auditing and access controls or suppress audit collection. Uh, the masquerader is likely uh, to be an outsider. Uh, the misfeasor is usually not. Actually, the misfeasor is usually an insider. And then the uh, clandestine user is going to be, uh, could be either uh, from the inside or the outside. Here are just some uh, examples of intrusion. Um, they range from being benign to being serious. So uh, at the benign end uh, of the scale, many people uh, just wish to explore the internet and see what's out there. And they may not even be trying to um, intrude. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the more serious uh, intruders are going to try to read privileged data, perform some unauthorized modifi modifications to data, disrupt the system, and so on. Uh, so you can see some examples here of intrusion, guessing and cracking passwords. Uh, so that could be um, benign or it could be uh, very malicious depending on uh, what the intent is behind that. Copying a database containing credit card numbers most likely. Most likely that one is going to be malicious. Running a packet sniffer on a workstation. Uh, that one by itself could be de benign, but if you're trying to capture usernames and passwords, for people who log into it, obviously then uh, it's probably getting more malicious. Uh, dialing into an unsecured modem, gaining internal network access. Um, these are all issues that possibly network security experts would want to test on their own networks. However, if you're doing this uh, in a malicious manner or on a different network, then uh, this is going to uh, most likely, uh, a lot of these things would be deemed illegal even. so. Make sure that you uh, understand if you're trying to do any of this and you're just trying to protect your own network is one thing. But depending on how you use the data or um, what the purpose of you doing that is, it might be deemed uh, illegal. So a hacker, traditionally those who hack into computers just do for it for the thrill or for status. Uh, a lot of people that uh, hack, uh, they're not necessarily trying to get any financial gain out of hacking. Some people are but the majority of them do it just because they want to see if they can and these are typically very very smart people and it's sad that this is how they're using their abilities because they are very intelligent um, and if they are able to hack successfully um, then they probably had some other career path in mind that they uh, could have made a lot of money on rather than just being a hacker but so a lot of people do it just to uh, see if they can um, intrusion detection systems IDS's and intrusion prevention systems, IPSs, are designed to counter uh, the hackers, the hacker threats. So organizations can consider also restricting remote logons to specific IP addresses, use virtual private networks, uh, and so on. These are just some of the uh, technologies which try to circumvent hacking uh, into it. Uh, a lot of organizations have what are called CERTs. These are computer emergency response teams. And uh, what they do is just to uh, monitor the network um, Hackers often will read CERT reports because that's going to give them a little bit of insight. A lot of those reports might be uh, internal, and so these could be internal hackers if they have access to them. Um, and it's important for system administrators that you have to make sure that you keep all of your patches up to date. It's really hard in large corporations to make sure this happens, which is why uh, they have, first of all, more network administrators, security experts in the company, uh, but they also have more problems because it's hard for uh, them to systematically make sure that every single computer in the organization gets the correct uh, update, the correct patches. Um, especially if you have a lot of different applications that are running in different departments and so on, you have to make sure that they all uh, mesh and that they're not going to have any problems from it. So that's very difficult for uh, a lot of 
companies and corporations, organizations to do. Uh, insider attacks are by far the most difficult to detect and prevent because that user most likely already has some kind of access that outside users probably do not have. So it makes it a lot harder uh, to uh, find them out. Uh, it can be motivated by revenge. Uh, maybe this is one reason why when IT personnel are uh, let go, either laid off or fired, they often are not given notice. And uh, as soon as it happens, uh, all of their privileges are taken away, their keys are taken away, and they're escorted out of the organization. This is because they have a lot of authority typically, or more so than other people, and they could really, really hurt the company. Now, it would be illegal if it was malicious. However, the company would still have to try to recover somehow. And um, so it's easier if you just don't let the situation arise. Don't put yourself in the situation where that could potentially happen. Some countermeasures. Uh, organizations do not want to give people root access. You want to give them the least privileges that they need. Uh, you don't want to give them more than they actually need to do their job. If you give them more than that, then you're setting yourself up. The company at least is setting itself up for possibly having uh, something happen. Uh, set logs so you can see what users access, what commands they are entering. Uh, this is very, very easy to do on many operating systems. Linux has it where you can track and see absolutely every single command that a user runs and it'll store it into a file. So that would probably be uh, something good to do. Protect sensitive resources with strong authentication. So make sure that not very many people have it, if any, and make sure that the authentication is very strong, that it's not based on some dictionary word. Uh, upon termination, delete the employee's computer and network access. This usually happens during the termination. So as soon as it's decided, this person is going to be terminated while they are in talking with their manager or bosses. The other people are actually deleting all of their access, possibly wiping their hard drive and just getting rid of everything that they have, uh, assuming everything's been passed off and backed up somewhere. And uh, upon termination, make a mirror image of the employee's hard drive before reissuing it. Uh, uses evidence if your company information uh, turns up at a competitor. So this is very, very important also that uh, you make sure that you've made a mirror image of the employee's hard drive and then chances are what you're going to do is you're going to probably just wipe that drive, install a fresh new uh, installation of the operating system on it, but you want to make sure that you keep that backup as I uh, just mentioned. Okay, here are some intrusion techniques. Uh, first of all, the objective of an intruder is typically to gain access to a system or increase the range of privileges accessible on uh, that system. So most initial attacks use system or software vulnerabilities that allow a user to execute code that opens a backdoor into the system. Uh, one approach here, um, most organizations are going to have a password file. Now, typically this is not a file which is unencrypted, and the passwords themselves that are inside of the file are typically not unencrypted. If that is the case, uh, this is something that needs to change immediately at an organization. You don't want to have unencrypted passwords just sitting on a server somewhere. So the passwords are typically encrypted, but all of the passwords are stored in a file. This is how Linux works also. Uh, you have a password file, and inside of that, you have these passwords that are encrypted. Uh, you probably want to protect that file also. You don't want somebody going into that file and changing all of those passwords. If that were to happen, people wouldn't be able to log back in to try to fix things. Uh, you would have to somehow have root access or be able to override whatever they change inside of that file. So it would be very good if you had um, uh, that file had strong encryption on it. Um, so it's very limited to uh, one account or just very few accounts. That's the access control. Uh, the one-way functioning, the system stores only the value of a function based on the user's password. Uh, so those are two ways that you can hopefully uh, fix that. Password guessing, if you want to just try to guess and again, I don't tell you these things so that you can try this. I do this more so that uh, you can uh, figure out uh, if your network is more secure. So uh, here are just some strategies if you're trying to guess a password. Uh, try the default passwords with standard accounts that are shipped, uh, that are shipped with the system. Um, this would be like, uh, let's try admin, let's try password, let's try PW, let's try no password. These are very, very common. You never want to have one of those passwords as uh, the password on one of your accounts. Uh, a lot of wireless routers, people will buy a wireless router and they hook it up and it just works right out of the box. And it's really great that we have that. However, uh, a lot of them have a default name of the wireless network as Linksys or uh, Cisco with a number following it. And then uh, the 
admin passwords, maybe like admin for the username and admin for the password. You don't want to do that. You got to make sure you go in there and change what that password is. Uh, you can exhaustively try all short passwords, which are from one to three characters. Those are terrible passwords. You know that a lot of passwords require you to have at least eight characters. They want some combination of numbers and characters, possibly, uh, or, or letters, possibly even some symbols uh, that have to be in them. Those are going to be the best ones. They're typically uh, not based on dictionary words because there are programs which just go through all of the words that are in a dictionary and try each one of them um, sequentially. Uh, and that's number three, try the words in a systems online dictionary or a list of likely passwords. Uh, you can find these online. Collect information about users. This one's getting a little bit more sophisticated. If you know a user's full name, you know the names of a user's spouse and children. Oftentimes people will use those as their passwords. Um, look at uh, what pictures they have in their office, books in their office that are related to hobbies. Uh, these are some strategies that could be used. These are probably, if you want to have a really good password, don't base it on any of those things. Uh, phone numbers, social security numbers, room numbers, addresses, license plate numbers. These are not things that you want to base it on because these are things that can be tied back to you somehow. So you want to make sure your password is not based on uh, those things. I know a lot of you might be thinking, oh my gosh, I need to go change some of my passwords. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, use a Trojan horse to bypass restrictions on access. We've talked about Trojan horses and how they can get around some security. Uh, tap the line between a remote user and the host system. This would be something like a man in the middle attack. Uh, and you can try to find out what the uh, passwords are. Uh, this might not work very well because um, a lot of passwords are going to be encrypted between the, um, uh, the, the host and the server. However, something else which is not on this list could be possibly using key loggers. And that's not guessing a password. but um, on the other hand, that is one way that you could get it if you have had a key logger installed uh, on a computer. Okay, so specifically with intrusion detection now, um, intrusion detection is a system second line of defense. It's based on the assumption that the behavior of the intruder differs from that of a legitimate user in ways that hopefully can be quantified. Uh, so here are some uh, considerations that you have here. Um, if an intrusion is detected quickly enough, the intruder can be identified, ejected from the system before any damage is done uh, or any data is compromised. So hopefully we'll be able to detect that an intrusion is happening very quickly. Uh, an, an, an effective intrusion detection system can serve as a deterrent, uh, kind of like having security systems on your home. Uh, if, a use, if somebody wants to get into your home, even if you have a security system, they're still gonna be able to break a window or knock down the door and get in. However, uh, the alarm is going to go off as soon as that happens. Uh, security systems often work more as a deterrent mechanism rather than um, catching somebody once it happens. I mean, that's secondary. That's the second line of defense. You're hoping that the security system and you've got that little sign out in front of your house or on your window that says that your house is secured, that that's going to be enough to uh, deter somebody from coming into your home and uh, they'll probably look for an easier target rather than yours. And that's what an intrusion detection system hopefully will do also. And it also enables the collection of information about intrusion techniques that can be used then to strengthen uh, future intrusion pre prevention facilities. Okay, taking a look at this, uh, this is just showing the profile of uh, authorized behavior compared to intruder behavior, um, probability density function. So whatever these lines happen to be measuring here, the bottom line, is that you're going to have some profile of what the network traffic looks like when you have uh, authorized users uh, on your network. Then you're gonna have uh, a different profile if it's an intruder. Now you do have some overlap and if the intruder is very sophisticated, they may be able to just operate in the area down here where you aren't going to be able to detect that it is an intruder, that it looks like it could be uh, authorized behavior. Um, Many intrusions aren't like that, and they're going to try to get as much as they can as quickly as they can, and that's where you're going to get this big spike uh, right when it happens. And so uh, these types of graphs are uh, often uh, used. These are generated by intrusion detection systems, and uh, there would be computers that would just have these graphs on it constantly throughout the day, and you have people monitoring it. If, the, uh, if there's some anomalous behavior that happens, then uh, it might send off an alert to uh, some network administrators or system administrators that there's possibly some kind of an intrusion uh, occurring right now. 
some approaches that we have to intrusion detection, uh, statistical anomaly detection, and uh, rule-based detection. So uh, we'll go into these in a little bit more detail uh, in the next few slides. Statistical anomaly detection uh, involves the collection of data relating to the behavior of legitimate users over a period of time. That's what we were just looking at uh, on that previous slide. Uh, we <coughs> determine uh, with a high level of confidence in whether that the behavior that we're currently seeing is legitimate or not. And uh, there are pretty good algorithms for doing that already. Uh, one of them is with the uh, called threshold detection. Uh, this approach involves defining thresholds uh, independent of the user for the frequency of occurrence of various events. And the other one is profile-based. Uh, a profile of the activity of each user is developed and used to detect changes in the behavior of individual accounts. So, uh, in essence, anomaly approaches attempt to define what's normal or expected, uh, whereas the signature-based approach uh, attempts to define proper behavior. Uh, Rule-based detection now uh, involves an attempt to define a set of rules or attack patterns that can be used to decide that a given behavior is that of an intruder. Uh, <coughs> okay, uh, a fundamental tool that is used for intrusion detection is called an audit record. Um, some record of ongoing activity by users must be maintained uh, for an intrusion detection system. So there's two different ways uh, that this input is fed into the intrusion detection system. One of them is through native audit records and the other is through detection specific audit records. With the native audit, audit records, virtually all multi-user operating systems include uh, accounting software that collects information on user activity. The advantage of using this information is that no additional collection uh, software is needed. So we're able to see uh, some information about user activity without having to install anything uh, else on it. The disadvantage is that this uh, the native audit record may not contain the needed information or may not contain it in a uh, convenient form. So um, so that's just a little disadvantage. You might need to uh, uh, mess around with the data a little bit to get it into the form that you need for your specific intrusion detection system since this is going to be mostly built into the operating system of how it's detecting it. Detection specific audit records now, on the other hand, uh, a collection facility can be implemented that generates audit records containing only that information required by the intrusion detection system. Um, an advantage here is that it could be made vendor independent and ported to a variety of systems. However, there's extra overhead in uh, having two accounting packages running on a single machine. So uh, our statistical anomaly detection, we talked about this a little bit on one of the previous slides. Uh, threshold detection um, involves counting the number of occurrences of a specific event type over an interval of time. If for some reason that count surpasses what's considered a reasonable number and the reason the way that we can get this reasonable number is maybe by tracking this for legitimate users over a certain amount of time and finding out what's considered reasonable so if it bypasses that then we uh, will say that maybe an intrusion is occurring and we can alert some network administrators so they can go check it out um, by itself this is a crude and ineffective detector uh, of even moderately sophisticated attacks, there are going to be a lot of false positives with this. Uh, maybe somebody at lunchtime decides that they're going to get onto YouTube or that they're going to um, go onto eBay or something like that, and it might just be out of the norm and it's going to raise this red flag uh, using threshold detection, or it's possible that it could. With profile-based anomaly detection, uh, it focuses on characterizing the past behavior of individual users or related groups of users and then detecting significant deviations. The profile may consist of a set of parameters so that deviation on just a single parameter may not be sufficient in itself to signal an alert. Uh, the foundation for this is uh, the analysis of the audit records that we just talked about. The audit records provide input to the intrusion detection system. Uh, the designer must decide then on a number of quantitative metrics that can be used to measure user behavior. Uh, the audit records then serve to define typical behavior. Um, so the intrusion detection system then analyzes the incoming audit records and determines if there is some deviation from the average behavior. 
Here are some measures that may be used for intrusion detection. So this could be some of the things that you would see on that graph uh, that we saw on the uh, one of the previous slides. Uh, login frequency, uh, location of login, time since last login, elapsed time per session, uh, quantity of output to the location, uh, password failures, how many password failures are there at login, uh, the frequency of execution of specific programs, resource utilization, uh, denials of execution of a program, how much uh, reading, writing, creating, and deleting is occurring during that session, uh, how many records are read and written. So these are some things that, we, that can be monitored so that you can try to detect if an intrusion is uh, occurring. Rule-based intrusion detection um, involves techniques that observe events in the system and apply a set of rules leading to a decision regarding whether a given pattern of activity is or is not suspicious. Um, so you can see down on my uh, bottom bullet there the rule-based anomaly detection is similar in terms of its approach and strengths to the statistical anomaly detection. However, historical audit records are analyzed to identify usage patterns and to automatically generate rules that describe those patterns. So these rules may represent past pat behavior patterns of users um, as well as the current behavior. So it's a little bit more sophisticated. However, you have, have to have a little bit more data uh, to operate on. It might take a little bit longer uh, for detecting them. Rule-based penetration identification um, takes a different approach to intrusion detection. The key feature here is the use of rules for identifying known penetrations or penetrations that would exploit known weaknesses. Um, so this would be if we know that we have some kind of an exploit or um, uh, some kind of a weak penetration somewhere, uh, then the rules-based penetration would probably be what we want to use. So perhaps we have a server where we can't update it because it's going to break our current application, but we know that there is a, um, a security risk there. So we could do something like this uh, with rule-based intrusion detection to uh, just try to monitor it and see if something is occurring. Honeypots are a really, really interesting innovation uh, that we have as far as intr intrusion detection is concerned. Honeypots are just decoy systems. They're designed to lure a potential attacker away from critical systems. They're designed to uh, divert an attacker from accessing the system, collect information about the attacker's activity, and then encourage the attacker to stay on that system long enough for administrators to uh, respond. Uh, this is really neat that we have this uh, this honeypot, which is sitting uh, somewhere either on the network or just outside of the network, and it's just there as a as a decoy, trying to get people to go to the honeypot rather than try to attack the systems that are inside. There could even be a data that seems to be legitimate there, um, but legitimate users would know that there's a honeypot and not try to access that. So any access which is going on on the honeypot, you can it, you can assume is probably going to be um, uh, an attack. So uh, you can make the attack even seem successful, which is going to keep the attacker on that system longer so that you can try to um, track them and find out more um, about what they're doing. And uh, a lot of, there's a lot of uh, work on honeypots and creating honeypots right now that's going on and uh, even creating entire networks of honeypots. It's uh, really interesting, something that you should try to read about outside of this class also. Here's just one example of where a honeypot could be. So it could be outside of the external firewall even. So uh, you try to block all the traffic that you possibly can coming through that firewall. However, a user might think that they're accessing something inside the firewall if you have a honeypot sitting out uh, outside of it. So kind of a neat, neat invention, neat way of going about uh, trying to detect uh, intrusions coming into the network. Uh, last slide for today. Um, the exchange format, so to facilitate the development of distributed intrusion detection systems that can function along a wide range of platforms, uh, standards are needed. So the uh, Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF, has an intrusion detection working group. And uh, what they're doing, the purpose of this group is to define data formats and exchange procedures for sharing information. Uh, of interest to intrusion detection with response systems and the management systems that may need to interact with them. This is hopefully going to improve the intrusion detection systems that are already out there. There are some RFCs already, 4766, 4765, and 4767 uh, that de define these. 
Uh, not very interesting reading. These were all issued in 2007. So if you want to take a look at those, those would um, probably be helpful if you really like intrusion detection systems and how they work. If you potentially want to work on one, you probably are going to need to know what those RFCs uh, are. Okay, so hopefully you enjoyed this lecture on intrusion detection systems. I would suggest that you go out, uh, look up some intrusion detection systems, even install them on your computer. Try to get a little bit of experience with how they work. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Good luck.